Okay. Hi, okay, welcome everyone. I'm Katerina from the School of Computer Science. You know me. Most of the people on the call, I think, are people of our school, if I can see. Uh, welcome to our last machine learning seminar for this year, 2021. We are glad that we had a second year. Now we have kind of passed our first year and we are slowly walking to, towards the mid of the second year. We had about interesting 15 seminars in the past year and a half. And we are very delighted to have Zach from Carnegie Mellon kind of finishing the 2021 series with an interesting talk. So I will let now uh, Michael Whitbrook, uh, which is uh, leading the uh, broad AI group to introduce our host. Our speaker, I apologize. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Kia ora. Um, so Zach is a, an assistant professor at um, Carnegie Mellon University in the machine um, learning group. Um, I think I first met him at a unconference um, at uh, Google mm. many years ago, um, uh, for, which I got a TensorFlow t-shirt. I don't know whether Zach has one of those as well. Um, perhaps we could. Um, match. I've actually posted Zach's uh, bio in the chat so you can read the details and go and subscribe to his blog and his uh, Twitter and his GitHub. But he's also got another bio on another thing in which he says that he regrets at UCSD not having learned to serve and dreams of retiring to an um, Aegean island where he can distill local herbs. Uh, Zach may not be aware of this, but New Zealand is also a major surfing power. And in point of fact, um, uh, and it's one of the best places in the world to grow herbs, and I'm not talking about those kind of herbs, but also um, it's fully legal here to distill stuff. Um, and a it's a popular um, hobby if my relatives are anything to go by. So Zach, you should definitely consider not just giving a talk here at the University of Auckland, but coming and visiting us once it's possible and um, indulging your um, both uh, childhood fantasies and um, your know, retirement plans uh, to see whether it's going to work out. Um, without uh, further ado, um, Zach will start his talk on ways of guaranteeing um, generalization performance of um, uh, a target problem by controlling representational shift in a training in a set of training problems. If I've got that right, um, and uh, take it away, Zach. Cool. Um, thank you for the, uh, the the nice introduction. I, yeah, I should uh, I should have cast a wider net for places I could uh, potentially retire to. Uh, you know, I had this one. Uh, I think my like first year of faculty. I think uh, if you. Uh, if you're on the, whatever, the bullet train, eventually you hit your breaking point. And I hit it like the first summer after and visited this uh, small Aegean island called Amorgos and turned my phone off for two weeks or 10 days or whatever. And I was like, this is, this is it. If, if, uh, if, if it doesn't become less stressful, I can always, I can always just come back here and uh, read, you know, become a second rate science fiction writer on this island. So, uh, but maybe I could do it in New Zealand too. I imagine New Zealand might be a little bit more expensive though. Um, so, no, all right, maybe, all right, still in the running. Um, great, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, wish, I, wish I could be there in person. Um, uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So I won't, I won't elaborate too much, I'll say briefly. Um, I, I run a, a group, a reasonably large group, perhaps bigger than I, I ever originally planned to run um over at cmu um but we cover um a lot of ground i'd say broadly what kind of animates the group is uh we call ourselves the approximately correct uh, machine intelligence lab and that's sort of a pun on two things um it's a one it's a reference to the sort of you know uh, perhaps the dominant like theoretical framework for thinking about machine learning problems that we uh um the sort of thing we could say is that we with high probability came up with a solution that is you know, so close to being uh, correct. Um, but usually uh, for us, it's a little bit more um, a second varied meaning that uh, we tend to focus on problems where what people, uh, you know, often people are animated by some actual real world problem. And so then they say, okay, let me go collect some data and let me come up with a machine learning system that will solve this problem. The machine learning uh, 
problem that they sort of fashion as a surrogate for the real world problem is almost and always is almost always in some way like fundamentally compromised. It is uh, itself like a uh, um, a crude approximation to what it is that the people are actually after. And, and this um, takes many forms, but one is that you uh, you know you model certain uh, things like predictive accuracy, but you don't take into account um, all sorts of you know other societal desiderata that you know um, uh, bear upon the system you're planning to deploy. Um, a very straightforward way in which uh, what we're doing is often almost just patently wrong is that we uh, purport, you know, if you read like the, the sort of uh, marketing language around machine learning in the wild, it's almost always purporting to take on a decision problem and say like, oh, we're going to make an artificial doctor, we're going to personalize medicine, we do all these things. Um, but then you look at what people are actually doing when they train machine learning models and the vast majority of them have never thought about decisions in a... Um, coherent way before for the most part what we do is we say here's a surrogate prediction problem and let's just like let's allow like magic fairy dust do the leap from if you can predict this thing in an iid fashion to like how would you actually make decisions that accomplish your real world goals and that's true even when the goals are kind of like mundane ones like just uh be profitable or something so like uh ad ad serving even is doing it's almost always doing the wrong thing right if you're doing matrix factorization what you care about is uh you know some treatment effect on people's behavior um, so, uh, we take on, you know, problems that for us feel like they're sitting in some kind of really unsatisfying spot between what people seem to be saying they're doing, what people actually are doing. Um, perhaps one of the, um, you know, areas that is, um, or, or one of the most like dominant forms of this is just the fact that more, one of the ways in which what we do in machine learning is sort of most removed from what we actually do in the real world is that we almost always just pretend that all of our data is um, sampled IID from some fixed underlying distribution. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna actually switch to, to like turn my headphones off and let's just see if uh, you can hear me just fine. Um, Cause that would be nice, it's actually. Feels a little bit like I'm on an airplane. I've been on an airplane for the last 13 hours, so this would be nice. Um, can you all hear me now? Yes. All right, lovely. It's nice to not feel like I'm underwater. All right. So, um, you know, one of the, the, the you know most fundamental ways in which what we're doing is like wrong from the get-go. Even if we presume that what we wanted to be doing was to solve a prediction problem is that we're almost always training models on some data that was either um, collected from some fixed point in time or from some fixed window in time, or it doesn't even relate to the natural distribution of any real world process at all. And now we're taking it, we want to go deploy it in some scenario that is almost always statistically different from that where we collected the data. Um, so um, we've done a lot of work on distribution shift. Um, I'll kind of touch on, just mention, uh, I'll kind of give like a little bit of a quick overview of like some of the way we're normally taking on uh, distribution shift, which is sort of covering some of the first works here, um, or at least kind of mentioning them. Um, I don't have time to go into all of them or even many of them in all that much detail, but if you want to take a screenshot, this is sort of the body of work from, from my lab that tackles these problems, or at least some of the body of the work, uh, not updated maybe to reflect like the last few months of uh, advances. And then I'll, I'll go into this last work, RAT, which I think is sort of a, a, an interesting complement. And the reason why is because um, the way that we're almost always tackling distribution shift in our lab is starting with it as a, here's something that's broken about machine learning is that we don't account for this. Um, that this is a facet of the natural world um, that we are confronted with, whether we like it or not, or whether we admit it or not. Um, what can we do? Um, in general, distribution shift turns out to be an impossible problem to, to resolve. Like uh, you just say, um, hey, here's some samples from one distribution, um, and maybe they're labeled. Um, in the future, you're going to encounter samples from some other distribution that is not the same distribution. Uh, and you should make accurate predictions on them. There's lots of papers that sort of say in an unqualified way, we do this, we do this, we have the GAN, we have this thing, there's a discriminator, we do something funny with the objective, whatever, whatever, and it's robust to distribution shift. If anyone says to you that their models like overcomes distribution shift in a kind of broad, like unqualified way, not like under some specific set of assumptions, 
um, then they're just definitely bullshitting you. Um, in general, it's a fundamentally impossible problem and not just in a contrived sense. Um, you can come up with multiple reasonable assumptions that where you could find many real world problems that would look a lot like one assumption holds and many real world problems that would look a lot like what you would see if a different assumption held. And there's no way from just looking at the data alone to resolve which situation uh, applies and where you will get conflicting answers for what you should do when faced with distribution shift. So distribution shift is normally like this sort of fundamental obstacle where now we need to sort of say, either what, what do I have to do? What information do I have to collect or how do I collect it? Or what assumptions do I have to make and how do I map things that I know about the real world to the appropriate set of assumptions such that I could tackle this kind of problem. And some examples of you know, these classical sorts of kinds of assumptions you can make, uh, they include covariate shift. A covariate shift uh, assumes something about how um, uh, what is stable versus what is not stable. It's something about what is allowed to change and what has to stay the same. Covariate shift, we say basically the, the marginal distribution over the inputs can change, but the uh, sort of probability of y given x is fixed across different domains. Label shift, we assume the opposite. So this corresponds to like the anti-causal set. We say y causes x and the process by which an X is generated given a Y, that's what's stable across time, but the marginal distribution of Y could change. So that would be like an appropriate modeling assumption, perhaps for modeling something like uh, changes of prevalence of a disease. So we've encountered a lot of problems that at least in the short run, look a bit like label shift, for example, in terms of COVID prevalence. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because the class conditions don't stay the same. Actually, over time, you know, vaccination rates change and diseases mutate and suddenly the class conditionals also start looking different, but that would be at least, you know, in the short run, maybe a well-motivated assumption. Uh, you've seen a lot of work on adversarial perturbations. You know, arguably these are yet another, just an instance of distribution shift where you've restricted the sets of distributions you could uh, potentially see in a, in, a, in a particular way, which is you said, okay, um, there is a, the, the underlying distribution is completely unchanged, but uh, I want to do well in the worst case over the push forward of that distribution through some kind of adversarial threat model. Um, so you've set a particular kind of objective, which is like a minimax scenario, and you set a particular set of allowable distributions, which is only things that are expressible by composing the initial distribution with a threat model. Um, so, so that's how I, I'm used to thinking about distribution shift. And I'll give you an example of some, some works in that vein, but then I'll flip uh, the script and, and go to the other side, which is a, a kind of funny paper that we have that I think gives an interesting perspective about generalization and deep learning. And here we've done the opposite sort of thing, which is we figured out, um, you know, how do we actually, you know, instead of saying, hey, uh, uh, distribution shift is a facet of the natural world, whether or not we acknowledge it, and we need to like grow our modeling scope to accommodate it and you know uh, deal with it in order to generalize well out of domain. Now we're going to show like a completely opposite perspective where we're going to say we're actually going to introduce completely artificial distribution shift in the form of label noise. And the purpose of doing that is actually going to be to produce a model for which we can obtain generalization guarantees that hold in domain. So it, it, it's a kind of, kind of funky thing. Um, so so let, me, let me kind of just give you a little bit of a, of a context here. Um, so, you know, again, standard ML, we sort of assume uh, the way this works is God, uh, you know, uh, showers data out of the sky. Uh, we collect some of it, we use it to train a model. Uh, tomorrow, God showers more data out of the sky and uh, that the relationship between uh, the world is sort of stateless. The, the transition function between yesterday and today is uh, is uh, just uh, you know uh, the copy the identity function. Like uh, God uh, wakes up in precisely the same mood as yesterday and showers data that is statistically identical. So it's just unseen examples from the same distribution. If you assume that, then you know you can basically create an, uh, a set of data that is exchangeable with what you will see in deployment time by just randomly partitioning your data set. You take whatever data you have, you randomly partition it, train on one, evaluate on the other. That's fine. That, that is representative of what you expect to see in a statistical sense. Um, but that's not what the real world is like, um, right? So anything can happen in the future. God wakes up, gets a new haircut, uh, showers data according to some new distribution. The question is, you know, what can you do? You might want to say, well, let's, let's make the robust classifier, you know, and 
surely it involves a, a GAN and uh, some skip connections and a unit and, uh, you know, some uh, incantations of some sort. Um, the problem is uh, you, that, doesn't, that doesn't in general work. Um, coming up with a single classifier robust under any kind of distribution shift, this doesn't even make sense. It's not a well-defined problem. It's like a contradiction. Um, if you don't say anything about how the distribution can shift, I can always conjure a distribution where, you know, you fix any classifier, uh, I'll give you a distribution where it performs badly. Um, so, um, you know, like uh, in, in the most trivial case, it's like, you know, think about like what a lot of people are uh, um, purporting to do. You can think it's sort of even like fundamentally, like if you change the name of the category, the problem would look identical from a standpoint of the learner, but the answer of what to do out of domain would be different. Like. If I had seen, um, you know, pictures only of uh, indoor cats and outdoor dogs or something, and you tell me uh, separate this, these images from those images, um, it could have been that we, we were meant was for me to separate indoor scenes from outdoor scenes or dogs from cats. I have no way of knowing. And, um, you know, you show me a, an unlabeled set of uh, outdoor cats. There's no, there's no way for me to distinguish it because I, I can't even pull out semantically what it was that was intended by the original categories. You could have meant either thing. Um, so here's an example of, of where the problem does become resolvable and the kind of work we've done. Um, uh, so so, so here, here's my sort of like first foray into distribution shift was working with uh, Yu Xiang Wang, who's an amazing scholar, uh, professor at UC Santa Barbara. Um, at the time we were both uh, spending a summer at Amazon and, we, and this work was co-authored with uh, Alex Smola. Um, and uh, we specifically were focusing on label shift. So to, to just motivate label shift a little bit, you know, imagine that you trained a classifier, it got some, uh, you know, we'll say uh, you're trying to recognize uh, whether or not someone has COVID based on looking at a chest x-ray or something like this. And your hope is that you'll just monitor all the chest x-ray machines in the future and be able to identify spikes in the prevalence of COVID by uh, spikes or drops just by monitoring, you know, the outputs of this classifier. So people do stuff like this all the time. They train classifiers on, uh, tweets to predict sentiment and then they just feed streams of tweets into the classifier and hope that they're going to you know monitor the, the the sentiment over time but you know if things are changing over time then the you know the distribution of inputs to your classifier is changing over time and you have this classifier the only reason why you believe it's any good was because of an iid evaluation so, so what makes you think this classifier is any good at all um what makes you think you know that you can look at the the, the outputs of this classifier, that the mean output of this classifier, and it'll tell you the prevalence of this disease. So you can imagine you train a model, you know, uh, the, the, the positive rate in the population is say like very low, like a fraction of a percent. Uh, you run on the training data, of course, you know, you're doing deep learning, so you classify the training data perfectly. So you predict 0.05% positive. Let's say you uh, post hoc calibrate your model and run it on the validation set. And um, indeed it predicts about 0.05% wild. And then you run it in the wild the very next day and it predicts 0.05% wild uh, positive. And then the next day, uh, you know, a, a few months later, there's, there's a, a big outbreak and your classifier is predicting that 5% of people and not 0.05% of people have COVID. Question would be like, well, how many people actually have COVID? On one hand, you know, you train this classifier to recognize, recognize COVID. You like to think that suddenly a higher fraction of images are being classified as COVID. You could you know, say, oh, the classifier is doing its job and it's alerted us. But on the other hand, it's like, why should we trust this probability at all? Because now we know that the inputs to the classifier are, are not statistically representative of what we saw during training. So we violated the IID assumption. Um, so formally, this can be thought of as a domain adaptation problem. And uh, the setup of a domain adaptation problem is you have some distribution of source data, P of X and Y, some distribution of target X, uh, data, Q of X and Y, and we have a labeled training example sampled from P and unlabeled test example. So we don't know the, the, the labels associated with any of them, not yet. We have to make predictions on them, but we get to see a lot of them from the test period. Um, so given that you have some collection of N training examples, all which are labeled and M test examples, which are unlabeled, you wanna predict well on these test examples. So you wanna get a, you know, update your classifier in such a way that it's gonna predict well on the test distribution, but you have to do this on the fly without having actually been shown any labels in the test distribution to sort of guide you. It's not like you could just fine tune on the test distribution because you don't have labels for it. Um, so, you know, you know, what you want to do is say, okay, our basic distribution shift. So, you know, you could say more formally, I, I want to have three goals. One is I want to detect that a distribution, uh, uh, that, that a, a shift in distribution has occurred. 
And I could tell this if, as long as I can conclude that um, the distribution of outputs in my classifier is not the same as the distribution of outputs of my classifier in the, in the source period, then the distribution must have changed because the marginal over X must have changed because you know, the outputs of my classifier are just a push forward of, of, of the samples through the classifier. So if the, if the, if the distribution of classifier outputs have changed, um, then the inputs have changed, which by the way, um, it's much easier to detect a change that shows up in the uh, distribution of outputs of the classifier because now you could do something like a parametric two sample test. Um, and uh, that's much easier to detect than, for example, trying to do two sampling and in, two, two sample testing in input space where your inputs, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's not that there's something fundamentally different about inputs versus outputs, but it's more that I'm a machine learning scientist and not say a, a, a statistical theorist. So to me, inputs and outputs have a special significance, which is I'm usually confronted with problems where the input is something massive and high dimensional like an image and the output is something like uh, a class label and in that case if i could detect a distribution shift and the distribution of predictions of outlay of class labels that's much easier because that's a either depending on how you interpret the label as like uh, you're making discrete predictions or you're making um um you know uh like outputting you know points on the simplex is either like a 1D two sample test, like how you could do a parametric two sample test, or this is um, like a 10D two sample test. But detecting shifts in input space means I have to do like a, you know, 400,000 dimensional uh, two sample test. And we know that the power of two sample testing decays badly in the input dimension, in the ambient dimension. So we don't want to have to do that. Um, I'm going to do this all without seeing new labels. Um, so the label shift assumption says, hey, um, P of Y can be different from Q of Y. The prevalence of the disease can change. However, the, the, the class conditional distribution, P of X given Y does not change between the source and target periods. So you can think of this as something like, um, you know, the number of cats versus dogs can change, but the distribution of cat images, you know, given that it's a cat, the distribution of cat images is the same in the source and the target period. Um, so we call this sometimes the anti-causal assumption. I'm borrowing the language of Bernard Cholkoff here from a 2012 paper, but the, the causal assumption means that you have a regression problem where you're trying to predict an effect from its causes. And the anti-causal assumption is that you're trying to predict the cause from the effect. So if you're trying to recognize like a disease from its symptoms, then that would be the anti-causal problem. You're trying to recognize as uh, uh, predict the future from the past, that would be a causal uh, learning problem. Keep in mind, it's not necessarily, um, uh, not all learning problems are either strictly causal or strictly anti-causal. Like you could have a learning problem where there is uh, some set of features where some of them cause the target variable and some of them are caused by the target variable. And now given, you know, all of these observables, you're trying to um, infer the value of this target variable. Um, so the question again is, you know, the problem here is that, uh, what we want to do, our first step is we just want to estimate Q of Y, which is the, the target, the label marginal in the target period, but we don't actually observe any samples from that distribution. We don't observe any target labels. So how can we infer the distribution of target labels? So it turns out that this assumption that the class conditionals don't shift is, is very strong and actually can save us. Um, and just by the way, you can contrast this with covariate shift, which tells you very different things. Covariate shift, uh, says that P of X could be different from Q of X, but that P of Y given X is the same as Q of Y given X. So you could factorize the target distribution this way, where you could substitute this P of Y given X for Q. And what that really means is, if you believe that you're in the covariate shift scenario, people always talk about covariate shift, like, oh, we need to solve this by doing, you know, importance weighting and whatever, whatever, whatever. And it's like, you need importance weighting to deal with um, uh, model misspecification. But if you're using super complex models, it's not even clear that covariate shift is actually a problem. Um, not if the supports match, because the, the, predict, the optimal predictor is the same for both distributions. Um, it's only uh, a problem, you know, under, under model misspecification, or if you have additionally a support mismatch, but in that case, you're, you're really fundamentally screwed, you know, like assuming covariate shift isn't enough, you, you need some kind of more heroic uh, assumption of some kind of invariance. Um, so I just note, you know, a, a difference here is in label shift, um, um, like, uh, let's say that there are no zombies out there. Uh, you know, zombies are 0.001% of the population. And then the uh, zombie apocalypse happens uh, yesterday. And now tomorrow, 
there's uh, the population's 40% zombies. And, you know, let's say one of the first uh, symptoms of becoming a zombie, if you've been infected with the zombie pathogen, is you develop a cough. So under label shift, you know, uh, you know, a year ago, whenever it was, when the prevalence of zombies was 0.001%, the probability that you're a zombie, given that you have a cough, is very low, because there's other causes of a cough that are much more prevalent. Um, so you say, okay, what's the probability of zombie given cough? And the answer uh, a year ago is like close to zero. Now, you know, midway through the zombie apocalypse, you know, you look and say, what's the probability that somebody's turning into a zombie given that they have a cough? It should be much higher. It should be much higher because your prior has gone up. Your prior goes up and your, that's like your posterior should go way up. That's not the case for covariate shift. You assumed covariate shift. It would mean that the probability of zombie given cough should be identical in both time periods. Um, so these are very different assumptions. They apply in very different scenarios. Um, and again, the reason why label shift is the appropriate assumption here for my zombie example was because of the arrow of causality, that the prevalence of the zombie apocalypse changes and induces a change in the prevalence of cough, um, which is not the same as if, you know, cough cause zombie. If, co if, if coughs cause zombieism or zombieitis or whatever it is, then, then you would expect that P of Y given X would be fixed across time periods. Um, so very different scenarios. But once you fix one you, um, and, and you zero in, you could find, um, okay, uh, I could look at the confusion matrices that arise from um, these different prediction problems. Um, sorry, I could look at the confusion matrix that arise from applying my classifier on these different distributions. And now I, I don't actually get to observe the guy on the right. That, the, the, that confusion matrix, I can't estimate it from empirical data directly because it is, um, uh, it requires that I have actually, that I actually get to see uh, labels from the target distribution. However, the confusion matrix on the source distribution P, I can estimate this guy from empirical data, specifically the empirical data from the source distribution. Now, these are two different matrices from each other, but it turns out that, well, when I focus on any one column of the confusion matrix, I basically, um, I've, 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 I've assumed the why. I've, I've said, okay, when, when, if I fix the underlying class, I look at any column, I'm saying when the, when the true label is label four, then I look, okay, of all the samples that come through it, I take those, I feed them through my classifier and I see what is the distribution of predictions. So if I only normalize the columns so that basically, you know, I'm, I'm looking at just conditioning when that is the true label. So if I look at the column normalized confusion matrix for all the columns sum up to one, then actually, for that classifier, the source and target data are the same. So, so the point is to say, I can, uh, if I normal, call normalize these guys, they're actually the same matrix for source and target data. And then because of, that's because of the label shift assumption, that's what allows me to, to conclude that. So then I can estimate the, the column normalized confusion matrix using source data. And because it's an identical object that what I've gotten is also the column normalized confusion matrix for the target data. So now I could look and say, um, Okay, so I can use my source data to estimate this column normalized confusion matrix, which is actually the column normalized confusion matrix of the target data. And I say, well, I have, I have this unlabeled target data. What can I do with it? I can't estimate a confusion matrix because I can't break it out into different columns. But what I could do is just feed all that data through my classifier and take the average of the predictions across all of them. So I can take the mean classifier output on the target distribution. That gives me this um, vector on the right. It's just y hat vector. And then I could look at this column of class conditional Y hats. And that's basically the column normalized confusion matrix that I can estimate on the source data. And now these guys actually turn out to comprise a linear system. And the solution to that linear system is the target label distribution. So it's like, I have a problem that was like impossible um, if I didn't make any assumptions, but if I say, okay, I'm gonna assume one thing, class conditionals can't change, but the label marginal can. Now I've identified, I've, I've said that as long as this confusion matrix here on the left is invertible, um, which is a fairly mild thing. I'm not saying it has to be a calibrated classifier. I'm not saying it has to be super accurate. I just said it has to be invertible, which means it's like, there's not like a few classes to which this classifier is completely unable to distinguish between them. It's like reasonably discriminative. Um, so this is a, a fairly mild assumption. So if this classifier is invertible, then this is an identified linear system. And the solution is actually um, the, the target uh, label marginal. So as long as I have a classifier, and keep in mind, this classifier could be trained on the source data, 
Now I can use it to construct a confusion matrix. Long that wire is like kind of okay. Um, now I can obtain a consistent estimate of the target label marginal, and I can use a class wire to, to recover um, uh, tar right, the, the target label marginal. And I'll, once I have the target label marginal, I could use that to go post hoc update my predictions and make more accurate predictions because I can account for the change in the prior. Um, so I could do a, a basically as long as my predictions were already kind of calibrated, which I could do sort of post hoc, you know, sort of heuristic, um, like some kind of bias corrective temperature scaling or like isotonic regression. Um, then I can I can I can post hoc update those to take advantage of the fact that now I have uh, access to the new prior. Um, so it's nice. It's a consistent estimate of the target label marginal. Um, if the classifier is just kind of okay, you get a decent estimate. But if the classifier becomes more and more and more accurate, then uh, this becomes your S, your ability to recover this, the rate at which you recover this, um, 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 uh, the target marginal improves as the classifier becomes more accurate. Specifically, um, uh, the rate depends upon the condition number of uh, this matrix. So as this matrix becomes, as the classifier approach, like if this classifier were perfect, then this would be a diagonal matrix. And so the, the, the smallest eigenvalue would be one. So that, that, that's what determines um, the rate at which you can estimate the target marginal. Um, so we went a bunch of different places from here and I'll just give a highlight, but I'm not going to go into depth in these works. One is we realized that, um, okay, actually if the label shift assumption holds, then we don't have to look at the inputs. We could just look directly at the output space, like the outputs meaning what pops out of the classifiers when we run the inputs through the classifier and if that classifier basically had an invertible confusion matrix, again, that condition that there was a non-zero smallest eigenvalue of that confusion matrix, then it's enough to look at the outputs of the classifier to detect a late, uh, label shift. You know, does this work for other kinds of shift? How, you know, in practice, if we came up with many kinds of um, sort of natural and synthetic shifts, how good a job do we do at detecting them for various choices of feature representation and two sample testing method? And it turns out actually, using a classifier that was trained on the source distribution is in almost all cases that we can contrive the best thing to do. Um, one notable exception is adversarial examples where it turns out that uh, you do a much better job detecting them by doing some very strange things like um, doing um, like uh, picking random pixels in input space and doing just individual pixel two sample tests. Um, you can have images that look really, really similar between two different distributions but if you fix a single pixel and you just look at the CDF of that one pixel, you know, the two dis distributions could look very, very different, the, the real and the adversarial perturbed images. Now, the danger there is, of course, if that's how you detect them, then an even smarter adversary can come along and design uh, an adversarial attack that will elude your pixel-wise two-sample test. But I, I won't go too deep into that. Um, it also led us to um, uh, ask them questions about how we normally correct for distribution shift. And the most common thing and a lot of people to do is say, oh, there's distribution shift. Um, let's estimate importance weights and do importance weighted empirical risk minimization. Turns out in deep learning world, what if anything is the effective importance weighted risk minimization or what, what, what in general is the effective importance weighting? Um, turns out to be a very complicated question with very unintuitive answers. And the answer is sort of in general, if you're in the realizable scenario where like, you know, you tr are training your model to like we do for CFAR or something to fully separate out all the classes to perfectly shatter the training set. When, when you enter that like interpolation regime, um, there is no impact at all of importance weighting or not in any of the key respects. Um, so uh, I have to be very careful about how you proceed in these problems. Um, we took a look at some of the things that people are saying are sort of like panaceas for distribution shift, including the use of these uh, domain adversarial neural networks. Turns out, um, they don't actually make sense in that uh, as in and precisely the case in which they break down or the easiest like didactic example would be a shift in label distribution. Um, so these are these approaches where you say, oh, let's just take the two domains and make them look the same in latent space, but such that a classifier, you know, on top of that latent space does well on the source images. It turns out if the label distribution is a mismatch across domains, the only way you could do well at this objective, the only way you can make them look the same is by misclassifying the target images. So we have a paper on this. Uh, I should have had a link here, um, but it's basically, it's called asymmetrically relaxed uh, uh, domain adversarial networks. Um, and this is um, <clears throat> work with my recently graduated PhD student, Yifan Wu. Um, 
we took a look back at label shift um, uh, and were able to actually unify a few, there were a few competing methods that seemed to work really well empirically, but had no theoretical foundations. And so we were able to identify, like, I should say, we were able to establish what are the identification conditions for these sort of more max likelihood based methods. Uh, so this is a recent work from NeurIPS last year. Um, and we've also extended our work into the, the reach where we're not just looking at detecting and correcting for label shift when there's shift among previously seen categories, but also allowing for the possibility that you have a shift among the previously seen categories. And on top of that, you have, um, uh, you may encounter, you know, one new category that was never seen before during training. So this is a setting where in, in, the, in the, if you simplify to the case where you say you've only seen one label before, and now you may see uh, up to two labels at test time, then this is precisely like isomorphic or is, is exactly um, um, uh, in terms of the mathematical formulation. If not, you know, if I'm not presenting it with the same, the common motivation, it's the same problem as uh, the problem of learning with positive and unlabeled data. So it turned out that um, kind of just like with label shift, one of the problems that people had is like a lot of the methods, the classical methods that were out there require that you estimate likelihood ratios in input space. And doing anything in input space is kind of a drag if you have super high dimensional data. We're able to sort of bring this a little bit into the modern world by saying, um, actually, if you have a good classifier, you can use a classifier as an instrument to do dimensionality reduction. And then you could identify everything you need to do just by looking at the outputs of this classifier. So you can look at like the push forward distributions through your source domain classifier. It turns out for dealing with positive and unlabeled data, um, we could do something kind of similar, but instead of uh, looking at the outputs of a source domain classifier, what we're looking at is the outputs of a positive versus unlabeled classifier. And we're able to identify some milder conditions than in the previous work for, when you're, for, for how, how you can establish what fraction of the unlabeled data is in fact positive. Um, so uh, basically this task breaks down into two sections. There's um, estimation of uh, the, the fraction of unlabeled data that is actually positive. And the second step is PU learning, which is sort of given that in the mixture proportion estimate, how do you now take this and come, you know, up, you know, come up with a classifier that's able to you know, uh, recognize positive versus negative, not positive versus unlabeled. Um, so there's a bunch of traditional approaches to these. Uh, I won't get too deep into them, but basically the problem is that the traditional approaches to this problem have like some, some undesirable features that they're either interesting heuristics, but uh, uh, they either require that you possess fully the Bayes optimal classifier. Uh, and if you don't actually have the access to the true P versus U classifier, then no, no guarantees about what you have. Um, so they don't tell you anything about how you know, things should perform. Um, or they require that you do density estimation in input space, which is again, the problem in label shift, which is just interactable when you have high dimensional data. Um, and you have a bunch of recent methods that I think had the right idea and spirit, which is using a classifier somehow to reduce dimensionality. The problem with most of these approaches is that um, they just sort of didn't say anything about uh, the statistical properties of the estimators that they produced. So they had the right idea, which was like, okay, you need to train a positive versus unlabeled classifier and do something with its outputs. But then what they came up to do with its outputs were sort of like weird heuristics that were mostly not right and didn't produce consistent estimators under any you know, coherent set of assumptions. So, so we kind of were able to sort of thread the needle here and come up with a method that under a sort of mild set of assumptions about your learned classifier is able to uh, um, identify the optimal, is actually able to identify, like provide a consistent estimate of the uh, mixture proportion. Um, and the last thing I'll cover here before we move into, um, oh yeah, Mike, uh, I will, I had a slide, um, um, oh, oh, because of the links, right, cool, yeah, I, I'm happy to share my slides or just copy the, the links out of that page, of course. Um, right, so, so our approach here and what we realized is that when you train a classifier and train a deep neural network to say, um, so you have the, now the positive and the unlabeled data. The positive is all, you know, one class. I have to say the positives are cats and the unlabeled is a mixture of um, cats and dogs. So you train a classifier to distinguish between positive, which is cats versus unlabeled, which is cats and dogs. 
Now, you can't get a classifier that's going to get near perfect accuracy here because there's, there's a fundamental problem, which is that the unlabeled and the positives overlap. Um, but what you can hope for is that when you learn a classifier, uh, so you train your deep net to distinguish uh, images of cats from images of cats union dogs, um, that what comes out, now you can't even hope that what comes out of that process is going to be a calibrated classifier. Neural networks in general don't produce calibrated classifiers. So what can we hope for? And the nice thing here is we can hope for uh, the one thing that I think we can count on in practice, and we demonstrate empirically that this holds across all kinds of domains, is at least we're, we're, in a, we're in a problem like this that's at least partially realizable. What we can count on is that we'll get out a model where if you were to bin up your predictions based on the probability assigned to being positive versus unlabeled, and you were to like look up, you know, move up from, you know, like, the, the bin that had like images that were, you know, were predicted to be like 25% likely to be in the positives versus the unlabeled to like 30 to 40 to 45, whatever, that as you went up the probability, as you went up in terms of the probability predicted of being in the positives versus unlabeled, you would also be entering regions where the actual probability of being positive was higher. And so we found um, that in this fashion, um, it like, you, you can just focus on the top bin, you know, if you just look at like the most positive 0.01% of predictions, they would almost be all be actual positive predictions. And as a result, you could basically just say, okay, in whatever is that like, uh, you know, that threshold that I have to set on the predictions, I just need to now count what fraction of positive images fall in that bin and what fraction of unlabeled images fall in that bin, because, the ratio of these will tell me what fraction of the unlabeled data set is actually positive. Now, uh, you end up having this trade-off, which is that if um, the positives are, um, sorry, if the bin is really, really, really small, you can't estimate what fraction of images fall in the bin because the bin is too small. So it's gonna take you an absurd number of examples because you're estimating a ratio of, of examples that fall in this bin in positive versus examples that fall in this bin in unlabeled. But if it's one, hundred thousandth of examples and you have 10 million in it, you know, and you only have 1 million images, it means it's only like 10 examples. It's like your finite sample error is going to be super huge. You're going to get a noisy estimate. On the other hand, as you grow the size of the bin, it's going to get a little bit noisier and noisier. So you're going to wind up with a situation where as you grow the size of the positive bin, you get a less finite sample noise, but eventually you introduce bias because you're, um, you're, you actually have some negatives that are that are getting classified as positives that, that are falling into this bin. And so what you could basically say is that you could draw an upper confidence bound around every point on this bin and establish a kind of uniform convergence results is that they're all valid um, upper confidence bounds. And so you could just basically pick the lowest point. So by minimizing the upper confidence bound, you're, you're basically um, trading off bias versus variance to get like the lowest upper bound you can on the actual um, positives. And if there does exist a pure positive top bin, then this actually will be in this upper bound will actually be a consistent estimate of the mixture proportion. So it says that, hey, we don't need a perfect classifier. We just need a classifier to have uh, a pure top bin. It doesn't matter how big it is, just as long as there, we don't have to know a priori what's the threshold for the pure top bin. But if there exists one, we can produce an estimator that will actually achieve um, you know, that will actually give you a consistent estimate of the mixture proportion. And so there's a bunch of math. I won't go into the actual technical details, but um, if you're interested in that work, it was just uh, accepted for an oral presentation at NeurIP. So my student, Sarab Garg, um, will be presenting that in this joint work with uh, Ifan Wu and um, uh, Alex Mola and Siva Balakrishnan. And I'll present, um, I'd like to get to it now. I, I've set you up and I don't have too much time, but I think we have enough time and maybe like, do we have 15 or 20 minutes? We started a little bit late. Uh, we can, we have 15 minutes if you can stay around, of course, yeah. Cool, great. So here's now like the converse perspective. I've talked about how you, you can, the distribution shift is like a problem to be overcome to achieve this out of domain generalization problem. Now I'm gonna go in the opposite direction and talk about introducing distribution shift and training on a different distribution other than like the clean data distribution for purposes of obtaining a generalization guarantee. Um, so let's just like take a step back and say, like, how do we in general certify that we have generalized? 
like how do we do this in machine learning? We, 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 we train on some training data and we want to say that we have generalized. So we could do two things, just two things that I know of, two like main dominant kind of ways of thinking about this problem. One is um, the uh, sort of classic learning theoretic approach where what we say is let's uh, establish um, some property of the hypothesis class that allows us to a priori guarantee uh, that the generalization gap will not be very large. So guarantee that the difference between the true and the empirical risks will be uh, less than some term uh, that depends on sort of the number of samples you've seen and something like the VC dimension or Rademacher complexity of the hypothesis class. So as, you, as the hypothesis class gets simpler, the numerator gets smaller. As the number of data points gets larger, uh, the denominator gets larger, but eventually this gap goes to zero. And as this gap approaches zero, what it means is that, um, I guess I keep seeing my image freeze. I hope my internet connection, I hope it's not freezing on your end. Um, as this gap goes to zero, then your empirical error basically, you know, must be, uh, equal to the true, you know, empirical risk must be, must be equal to the true risk. You could say, okay, I have generalized. Now, the other thing you could do is you could take your data, you could split it in half, and you could say, I'm going to train on this half, and I'm going to evaluate on the other half. And in this case, um, you know, keep in mind, both actually saying anything about the generalization error, not the generalization gap, in both cases requires that you actually train the model. In the first case, you know, you a priori bound the, uh, bound the generalization gap, but you still need to train your model to obtain the, the empirical risk such that now you have an upper bound, not just on the difference between the empirical and the true risk, but actually on the true risk itself. Um, in the latter case, you need to train the model to obtain its performance. Uh, and then um, what you're going to do is after you've already trained it, you're going to run it on the test data and evaluate it. And you'll get a bound here, which will it'll still be an approximation, right? Because you only have a finite number of test samples, but it'll be, uh, this will give you um, a bound on your, on your uh, test error. Um, so, you know, an estimate with confidence interval. Of course, now, if you do this over and over again, then the question is at some point, well, these test samples aren't really independent of the classifier. And once that's the case, you, you know, realize, well, now you don't have any guarantee on the test error and you could maybe, um, have some, you know, even though like maybe learning theory is unfashionable, it can give you some appreciation for why um, for everyone find at least, you know, for a while, uniform convergence to be such a powerful idea because at some point, um, you know, even if you have a test set, uh, you know, not for long. Um, I guess you can make a similar meta argument among the learning theoretic that was well once you try a new hypothesis class your learning theoretic bound is out the window but i will i'll, I'll leave that alone for now so these two dominant approaches right one is a post hoc bound where we certify on test data the first one uh an a priori boundland generalization gap that comes from some known property of the hypothesis class now there's problems with both of these approaches and i want to be very clear at the outset that i'm not purporting to displace like learning theory in general or classical results and we're also not purporting to like come up with a catch-all substitute for using a test set. We think people should still keep using test sets. Um, this is just um, maybe providing like a, maybe an interesting like new perspective. Um, so again, let's talk about some some things that are unsatisfying about these two approaches. With the a priori bounds, they typically rely on this you know complexity measure over the hypothesis class. We have to be able to establish a uniform convergence. Unfortunately. Uh, we don't have uniform convergence type results or or the typical complexity measures don't actually give us uh, useful uniform convergence results for deepness. They're too complex. You only get sort of like vacuous results on, on deep neural networks. So it's unclear. You know, you, you could argue that with neural networks, we don't really care about every setting of the parameters, that there's some implicit smaller hypothesis class, which is determined by things like the initialization scheme and the you know, uh, you know, the optimizer that you use and say the number of epochs that you train and this defines an implicit hypothesis class that has some kind of intrinsic uh, complexity that is somehow lower. The problem is nobody knows how to measure that. You know, no one knows how to, there's not like a formal characterization of this implicit smaller hypothesis class that, you know, leads to better generalization. 
Um, so, so we have this problem with a priori bounds that they don't actually tell us anything concrete about neural networks, not right now. On the other hand, we have a problem with the train test split too, right? That if we successively reuse the holdout set, um, we could have problems with adaptive overfitting. Um, this, you know, there's the class problem that this restricts the amount of data that's available for training. Um, and it could be the fact that like, we might think we have a test set and then, you know, somebody notices six months later, oh, actually there's something wrong with the way that the splits were done. And there are some examples that are duplicated or whatever, whatever. And it turns out we don't actually have um, a proper IED test set. And now, you know, what can we do? Um, so there's lots of reasons why, uh, you know, the train test split, you know, approach to guaranteeing generalization is also not perfectly satisfying. So here's um, our idea, which is say, you know, okay, let, let's kind of go with this, not a priori bounds, but sort of say after the fact, like after we've trained or while we're training along the solution path, you know, have we in fact generalized? So we're not saying, you know, I'm not gonna give you an approach that says, hey, uh, you tell me your model architecture and I'll tell you how well you're gonna generalize. What we're gonna do instead is say, you train on the training data. And um, I'm just gonna look at the training data and tell you, uh, have you generalized so far? And, and to be clear, I'm not gonna tell you both ways. Like if I say no, it doesn't mean no, you haven't generalized. It means no, I can't guarantee that you've generalized. So I can't just like look at the training data and exactly tell you your generalization error, but I'm gonna come up with a, a guarantee based on looking at the training data. And the, the, the weird aspect of the idea is I'm not gonna train on the original clean data that's properly well distributed. I'm gonna actually introduce distribution shift. And so the way, is I'm going to alter the training distribution so that it includes a mixture of clean and mislabeled data. Um, now, in practice, I don't want to take away clean data that's actually clean um, and not have access, the learner have access to it because I've like taken it and I've mislabeled it and thrown it back in. So, what we're going to work to is an approach that we can actually use um, um, unlabeled data instead. So I'm gonna, like a theory, it's easiest to see it with uh, mislabeled data, but then you can get to the point where um, you can get the same result where what you do is you take clean data and then you take some unlabeled data for which the labels are unknown and you just assign random labels to them and throw them in with the clean data. And then we're gonna train on them together. And by monitoring the performance on the clean and uh, randomly labeled uh, partitions of the, the, the data set, we're going to be able to make a guarantee about how well we've generalized and one that's actually going to be non vacuous even on like deep networks and even in practice so um the key is to establish that you know over time as we're training if we have fit the clean data well but not fit the mislabeled data and we could back out to how well we fit the clean versus mislabeled data, even if it's actually clean versus randomly labeled data. But if we fit the clean well, but not fit the mislabeled data, then at that point, um, we can conclude that we have in fact generalized. So we can't certify that that would have happened, but if that happens, and it turns out that it does happen a lot. So people have written a lot of papers about what they call the early learning phenomenon, that if you introduce label noise and you train a deep network, that it'll first get really good at classifying the clean data before it starts overfitting to the noise and falling off. So we're just saying, if you get to that early, we're not certifying a priori that early learning will happen. We're saying if early learning does happen, which it seems to based on all kinds of domains where this phenomenon has been demonstrated, then we can, at that point, when early learning is going on, we can certify that your classifier actually has generalized and we actually get a really good estimate of the generalization error, even without consulting test data. We get like an uncannily good uh, estimate of the test error. So um, again, we don't advocate this as a blanket replacement for the holdout approach. Um, but an important thing is that these bounds do not depend explicitly on any known complexity measure of the underlying model class. So what we're doing is we're, 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 we're saying we have a hypothesis class where we don't know anything. We don't have, know how to characterize its complexity. But as we train, if we fit the clean data, but not the randomly labeled data well, then we can certify that we have in fact generalized well. Um, so here's the big picture of how this works. We take the labeled uh, data 
that is um, clean, we take some unlabeled data, we assign labels to it randomly, and we dump them together. Now, the model that's being trained doesn't know which are the labeled versus unlabeled data. It doesn't treat them differently. It's doing just normal risk minimization as if they're completely interchangeable. However, we, you know, in the meta algorithm, we know which data points are the clean ones and which are the random, had randomly assigned labels. And so we're going to keep track of these two populations, these two subpopulations of the training set over time. And then what we're going to do is we're going to track the performance. How well is the model performing on the clean data and on the randomly labeled data? So again, we have um, clean data, we have randomly labeled data. And here's, um, uh, right, and then we're going to take their union. That'll be the actual training data, the clean and the randomly labeled data. Um, one thing that's important to note is that the randomly labeled data contains both clean data and mislabeled data. So I think it's binary classification. We flip the coin to assign the labels. 50% of them, by chance, gave the correct label. And moreover, that subset of the, of the randomly labeled data is going to be exchangeable with the clean data. They're, they're distributionally identical. However, there's this other 50% of, the, uh, of the randomly labeled data that by chance got the mislabeled. And so we can sort of like, you know, in, interpolate through um, the performance on the clean data through the randomly labeled data to get the performance on the mislabeled data. And that's what we're going to care about. So here's, here's the bound that we end up getting. So this is when our, our uh, and, and, and I think unpacking this is like the, the kind of central idea. So here, here's this kind of interesting result. Um, you do empirical risk minimization. So you take this data, you dump it together, you train a classifier, which just comes up with the empirical risk minimizer on the, the mixture of clean and randomly labeled data. And now I can, Establish the following bound on the generalization error, which is the, the generalization error is going to be less than or equal to the error on the clean data plus one minus two times the error on the randomly labeled data. This is all for binary classification now. It extends to the multi-class case, but it's just easier to get your head around it in the, in the binary case. Um, right? It's going to be less than the, the error on the clean data plus one minus two times the error on the randomly labeled data. So keep in mind, this is training data. You are training on this randomly labeled data um, together with your clean data. And what you're doing is you're looking at the performance on each split. And so you could say, um, you know, imagine that you, like in the extreme case, the best case scenario is, um, and keep in mind, by the way, initially, your randomly labeled data is going to have accuracy 0.5. Like any classifier, before you train, you just fix any random classifier. You take examples that are like uh, randomly labeled, your error at predicting those labels for this classifier is going to be 0.5. It doesn't matter where that classifier came from. It doesn't matter if it's a true classifier or if it was a totally bad classifier because the labels are assigned randomly. So your label on that partition, on the noisy partition, is initially going to be 0.5 no matter what, you know, just up to like, you know, the you know, how do you have enough data that this is roughly true, right? Just like, you know, if your true error rate is 0.5, you know, if you only have, your test set only has one example, you may or may not estimate it as 0.5, but you're gonna have this nice one over root n convergence and you'll, you'll get uh, a pretty good estimate of, of, your, of your actual error as long as you have like a couple thousand test examples. So here, what we're saying is, um, now if after training, your performance on the randomly labeled data is still about 0.5, then this one minus two times that is going to be equal to zero. And if so, it's basically if you if you if you're still can only fit you're still only fitting the randomly labeled data basically at chance, but your performance on the clean data is down to zero, your error is down to zero, then you have in fact generalized. And this term on the right is just a sort of like one over root n term that accounts for the fact that you have to estimate all these Bernoullis. So um, this result basically says, hey, if I fit the clean data, but I wasn't able to fit the randomly labeled data, then I know that I have, in fact, generalized. Um, on the other hand, what happens if you're in the deep learning scenario where you train for 1,000 epochs and it doesn't matter if the labels were clean or noisy, you eventually completely fit all of your labels? Well, in that case, if you completely fit all of your labels, including all of the noisy labels, then at that point, um, you're 
you know, your error on the randomly labeled data is going to be zero. One minus two times zero is one. And that basically means you can't say anything about generalizations. This, this totally matches your intuition that like once I enter the regime where I'm perfectly shattering the training set, I can't look at my training performance and say anything about generalization. But if I'm earlier in training, I look at it and I'm fitting um, the clean data perfectly, but the randomly labeled data badly, then I have in fact generalized. Um, so there's two steps to like kind of establishing this result. And the, the easiest way is to first start off to say we know which ones are the cleans and which are the mislabeled. And we're just going to train on these guys. And now the, the funky thing about this result is that normally when you try to prove generalization, you're trying to improve that. Um, um, I uh, know it doesn't matter how much randomly labeled data you use. You can have any ratio of clean to randomly labeled data and you do have to double it. And the reason why you have to double it is because it's we're looking at the randomly labeled data of which 50% is clean and 50% is mislabeled. If it was the mislabeled data, then you wouldn't have to double it. So um, if you so, so here's like the result basically. What, what you're normally you're trying to do when you're trying to prove generalization is you're trying to prove that overfitting won't be too bad. You assume overfitting will happen, you assume it won't be too bad. Um, now we're in this weird opposite result, which is what we want to certify is that overfitting in general does happen. And in particular, what you want to say is that given that you have some mislabeled data among your training data, you want to prove that you will fit those mis that mislabeled sample at least as well as you fit the population of mislabeled data. That's a funny quantity to wrap your head around the, quant the, the population of mislabeled data. But what, by that, what I mean is like uh, essentially the population, which is the same as the underlying population for your clean data, but just where all the labels have been, you know, intercepted and flipped from zero to one or from one to zero. So what you can do is you could say, well, like, let me look at my performance on my, uh, let's say I train on clean and mislabeled data. I get out the empirical risk minimizer and I find that I have 0.99 error on the mislabeled data. Well, the only way I could, if overfitting in general happens, then my 0.99 performance uh, uh, error on the mislabeled data is actually lower than my pop, my error on the mislabeled data. Let's just say it's 9.5 to just make it simple. So I got 0.95 error on the mislabeled data, but the error on the underlying population of mislabeled data, like I'm only going to overfit to the, the mislabeled points that I have seen versus mislabeled points that I haven't seen. Um, so establishing that that'll be the case is actually some fine details in the analysis because you're not just training on the mislabeled data, you're training on the mislabeled data together with the clean data. So you basically have to prove that we could treat the clean data as a constant. And this will be for any, any clean portion of the data, we could treat that as a constant. This is going to hold point wise over the sample, uh, over those, it's gonna hold point wise. And then we could just look at the sample of the mislabeled data and say, in general, we're gonna fit the finite sample of mislabeled data better than we fit the population of mislabeled data. So if you have 0.95 error on your mislabeled data, then you'll have 0.9, something greater than 0.95 error on the population of mislabeled data. But keep in mind, high error on mislabeled data means low error on clean data because there's, you know, one is equal to one minus the other. The error is equal to one minus the accuracy. So things get a little more complicated when you get to the multi-class case. But basically what, what this allows you to do is to say, okay, if after training on a mixture of clean data and mislabeled data, I have super high error on the mislabeled data, then I must have super low error on, on, on the true population of clean data. And so, um, you know, basically proving that your miss, like your populate, like your, Showing that your uh, empirical error on mislabeled data is high means that your um, that's a lower bound on your empirical error on uh, uh, the the underlying population. Uh, sorry, it's an underbound on, on the population error of mislabeled data, which means it's also a lower bound on the accuracy on clean labeled data. Uh, so, so that's that's this kind of trick is that. Now, it turns out that you don't actually have to know which are clean and which are mislabeled because we don't need to break out individual samples. All we need to do is be able to back out the quantity. And so because you know if you just assign labels randomly to some bunch of data for which the labels, so you don't have to take data away from your clean examples and assign uh, you know, possibly mislabeled 
mislabel them and then you, you don't get to use them for training, you can keep all of your clean label data. But if you have access to IID unlabeled data, you can assign the labels randomly and basically back out, okay, I know the clean performance and I know the random performance, which means I know if I, if I just fit you know, a straight line through them symmetrically, I know on the other end, I find the performance on the mislabeled data. Um, so we, we can extend this to the multi-class setting. We can show that it's never going to exceed the Rademacher complexity bound is actually going to be um, effective in all kinds of settings when uh, we, we don't actually get a useful result out of the, the, the known or empirical Rademacher complexities. Um, we can show that this necessarily is true also on linear networks. And so meaning if we're doing uh, if we're if we're on a linear network and we're doing gradient descent on, on on some convex loss that's like a surrogate for classification loss we can still show that this phenomena will hold that um you know you can look at the the clean and mislabeled errors and they'll give you this estimate of of the um the population error they'll give you this upper bound of the population error so even when you weren't doing the empirical risk minimization on the same loss as you actually care about um, which is normally what we're doing. Like we're minimizing cross entropy loss, but we care about error. Um, and then we can we have to make a, an additional, you know, um, um, leap to go to deep nets, um, which is basically we have to do is have to assume that this overfitting happens lemma like holds. But it's sort of an uncontroversial lemma. Like in general, everyone assumes that you will fit as well. And to give some intuition for why it should be a little bit uncontroversial. Um, uh, you know, you probably never ever trained uh, a deep net and found that like your training, you know, when you actually had an IED split and found that your training error was actually um, much higher than your population error. Uh, um, and it, it's intuitive because in the early phases of training, uh, learning dynamics for deep networks actually resemble those for linear models for which our lemma is like fully proven. And the later stages of training we have no doubt at all that we'll be overfitting. Like at that point, neural networks tend to interpolate the data. They tend to overfit maximally. So it gives a sense of why this result holds in practice. And so I know we're a little bit over time, but I just want to um, give some examples empirically of what this result looks like. So here's an example of over time. Uh, you'll note that the, the actual uh, test error um, for both an MLP and a ResNet for CIFAR bounces around quite a bit. Um, and these aren't just noise in the sense that like they're not noise in the with respect to the sampling of the test set, they're just noise in the optimization pathway. But um, kind of strikingly, um, you know, to, to like an uncanny degree, the, the bound that you get from looking only at the empirical data that you're training on here really closely uh, follows the performance that you get um, if you evaluate on a test set. Um, so this thing that we get without even looking at a test set tells us almost exactly what the test set performance is going to be for about 100 epochs. Now, keep in mind, there's a caveat here, which is that we, the price we paid for that is that we introduce noise into the learning process. So we're getting performance that is not quite as good as we would if we were training in a completely noiseless scenario. Note also that if we kept training for hundreds of epochs and suddenly the model started fitting the noise, um, eventually that guarantee would completely fall off because our you know, this, this uh, dotted line is sort of our lower bound on uh, the test performance. And eventually it's going to, you know, that, that if we perfectly fit the, all of our training data, including the randomly labeled data, that's going to just fall to zero. Um, see similar results for um, IMDB. Again, note here for this like Elmo LSTM, and you look as like we're training for more and more and more steps, you know, you have this bound that is this nice lower bound that's closely tracking the test performance. But eventually you start overfitting the crap out of it. And sure enough, the lower bound falls off and becomes vacuous. So, you know, we're, our bound doesn't tell you anything about the performance of the classifier at the point where it's completely overfitting the training data, but it does at that earlier point where, you know, and, and the important thing is it's possible, like you can have completely overfit all of your cleanly labeled data. Um, not, I would say not overfit, but fit all of your cleanly labeled data, you just can't have completely fit the randomly labeled subset of the, of the training data. Um, so you see this result here again, that if you, um, you, you push out the number of epochs far enough, eventually the, the, this particular lower bound falls off because now you've started overfitting the, the unlabeled data. Um, and this is just showing you the estimates. This is ignoring the, the one over root n terms that you get from the fact that you're dealing with finite samples. Um, 
Cool. So thank you. I, I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, I, hope, I hope it's not too much for trespasses. We started a few minutes late. And if anyone has questions, um, I'm happy to hang around for a bit. Thank, thank you, Zach. Yeah, that was elaborate, the, the last part, but that's exactly what was the title of the talk. So it was good to hear the details. Okay, so um, I think you were following up the, the questions in the chat, but if we haven't answered some, just let's go back. Uh, there was I think one. The, everything was okay. To what extent can the post hoc prior update be automated? That was one question right. earlier, but I'm not right. sure if you yeah, saw that, that. that one wasn't answered. You're right. Okay. Uh, so let's see the post hoc uh, is at 435. So I think this is when we come out label shift. Um, right. So this can be completely automated. And that's kind of the thrust of the work is that you can um, imagine a scenario where you have a classifier running in the wild over time. And so what you would do is if you knew that you were in the label shift scenario that like the, you get, if, you, if you don't know anything about the assumption on what kind of shift you'll encounter, you can't make any assumption about, you know, what the, the, you, you, you don't have a coherent method for telling you what the label marginal will be on the fly. But if you, if you believe in the label shift assumption that the, the class conditional distributions are roughly unchanged over time, and we're looking on working on some, some more robust versions of that where we could tolerate even, you know, some like Wasserstein kind of bounded like divergence in the class conditional distributions. But if you're in, um, right, so you're in that setting, you believe the label shift assumption and the, the distribution is changing, up, you know, per label shift over time, what you could basically do is on the fly Let's just say in the simplest case, you've like been up time into windows. So, you know, you have like days or hours and you have enough data coming in that, you know, you could, you know, you have enough data that you can get a good estimate just by looking at, you know, you're like Twitter or something. And you can just look at like the last hours of data. You do is each hour, you could basically bin up the data. say, okay, I want to get an updated um, label marginal by, by just taking this data together with the source data. So I'm going to take it, run it through the class, right? Get it out, take that source confusion matrix, solve the linear system, get the new marginal. And then basically just, um, this, this updating to the, you know, incorporating that prior to update your classifier. It basically just means that you take each of your predicted classes, multiply them by the likelihood ratio, and then renormalize. So that's, that's completely automatable. It's like, you're just taking a bunch of probabilities, um, uh, multiplying them by like, uh, you know, uh, element wise by a vector of likelihood ratios, which are just the uh, Q, Q of Y divided by P of Y, and then uh, renormalizing that so it sums to one. So that's basically all there is to that whole process. Um, yeah, Michael. I have a quick, yeah. Um, so given that this allows you to tell whether you might be overfitting, could it be combined with either a um, sampling policy to select the size of a training set or an active learning policy to um, determine sort of the composition of the training set that will, you know, make it more likely that you are fitting the sort of underlying distribution rather than overfitting to some, uh, you know, to, to, to some spurious distribution. Um. So I'm not 100% sure just like how to parse the semantics of the question, like what precisely it means to pick the training set differently. So, so you've, got um, a limited, you've got some limited training set, right? Could this give you some advice on how to extend that training set? How to extend it? Right, if you had a means of generating other results. So, so say you're doing, uh, focusing on active learnings particularly. Right. If you could generate additional um, training examples, can this give you any advice about which ones to generate or where to uh, generate them or when to stop generating them? Um, I, it's, it's like how to put it. I, I don't want to rule out a possibility if you have a creative idea. Maybe, maybe there you can conjure something, but not not one that I see. Okay. Um, it's very specific to saying this is the distribution. Now we can say, have you actually fit it? Um, now, yeah, so, so, so I, I, it doesn't necessarily tell you 
like okay if you trained on uh counterfactual distribution you know like or you biased the sampling in some way like how would you be likely in the future? Like, would, do you think you would produce a model? In, in some ways, it's it, it's a weakness and a strength, though, because part of what makes the whole method so you know strong in the first place is that um, it's all retrospective. So you know, when we're not saying anything about you don't have to know anything in advance, even about the model class. You don't you don't tell us like oh. Uh, it's got this rata mark because it's, it's VC dimension, whatever you say, I, I'm training this model by gradient design. I say, okay, great. Uh, you train it and I'm, I, I, you, you give me a model where nobody in the world knows how to say whether or not it will generalize. And yet I, get, I have a process here where we could, without looking at any test data, we can tell you that it has generalized. So we've assumed nothing about, very little about like how this thing learns or, you know, how we might but if you, but by, by the same token, because we assume almost nothing about it learns, it's hard to imagine, like, what do we have to say that's specific to, because the question of like, well, if I sampled one set, you know, if I grab a particular sample versus another, in some ways, it's a sort of concern that is sort of model class dependent, you know? In general, I have worked on active learning a lot and it's a, you know, it, the, it, it it's, a, it's a problematic enterprise in general in that um, it, it's one of these things where we have these very simple toy results with like thresholding problems where we get this like exponential versus polynomial like sample complexity, which is like great. We're like, okay, this is awesome. Um, you know, as, as the samples go up, you know, my like error can go down uh, um, by like an exponential factor and you're like, this is wonderful. But the problem is that even in linear problems, um, active learning, like, you know, it's like this provable case where like active learning, like an agnostic linear setting, uh, can do no better than in general than um, you know. C c there exists plenty of distributions where I'll do just as bad as random sampling and possibly worse. Um, you know, now in the deep learning setting, nobody has any proofs that anything they're doing with active learning makes sense. It's it, it's entirely based on saying, well, I don't know. Uh, let's go to the whiteboard and lay out like twenty things that sound like intuitive acquisition functions. And then you could try all 20 of them. And what I think broadly we're doing as a community is we try all 20 of them. And most of them don't do any better than random guessing. And eventually someone gets a result that looks like it does a bit better than random guessing. So we say, okay, um, this is a good active learning strategy. And the problem is of course, that it's pronounced retrospectively. And you know, you, you got to a, a acquisition function that does better when you acquire 10% of the data. But in order to identify that acquisition function, you have to train hundred acquisition functions. And those hundred ac acquisition functions between them touched all of the data. So we're pretending that we're only looking at 10,000 data points. So really we looked at all hundred thousand. We probably did it many times over in order to determine a good acquisition function that was good when then subsequently run on, you know, so I, I, I've worked on some papers trying to develop such acquisition functions, but then also gotten a little bit more maybe, um, I don't know if cynical is the right word, but just like kind of sober about it. Um, there's another weird problem, which is, yeah, another weird problem with it is that you always couple the model that's doing the selection to the model that you're training. And then we had one paper where we just looked one step beyond says, what happens if you just use one model and an acquisition function that seems to work for it? And then, you know, the, the next, uh, you assume that, you know, in general, there, there are notable examples, but I say for the most part, um, data sets tend to have a longer half life, a longer shelf life than models in machine learning. There are ex ex exceptions like uh, certain recommender systems that like, I don't know, like Netflix or Amazon, where they might be retraining them nightly or weekly to adjust for, you know, changes in the inventory. But I think in general, data sets last longer and models change more frequently. So even when you think you have a gain due to active learning, if you then train a subsequent model like, you know, okay, you train the LSTM, but now you got to train your transformer model. You train the MLP, but now you got to train a CNN or whatever. Um, do the like presumptive gains due to active learning actually transfer across models? And the answer seems to be by and large, no. It seems to be at best a little bit worse than having done random sampling, if, unless you're planning to use that same model forever. Thanks, great answer. Very helpful. I will now be more cynical. <laughs> yeah. Not enough so far, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and one last question, then we will end up from Luke. Uh, do, 
Okay, Luke is clarifying his question. We, do you do we, some? Should, should we ask if Luke okay. Ask himself? Okay, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh... Oh. Oh. <laughs> we lost Luke. No. Oh, by accident, maybe I. Wait. I allowed him to talk. No. You want Luke? Can you hear me? Or? Yes. Yeah, yeah you, got, you got censored. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, just the question I just put there. So I feel like if there's a half month of the label has a using random label, but then so basically you re repeat the same input twice, right? Will the model have a hard time to converge? Because even you think about it, if you run any sort of stochastic gradient descent algorithm for each batch on the same input, you basically always get the same output, right? Yeah, and so, then... Um, so I would just know in, in general, like, does... So the problem, the case that this problem arises, like a kind of, um, you know, like a finite domain, like a finite discrete domain. Like, you know, okay, uh, you know, I have like a four features and each one is either a zero or a one or something. I have 16 distinct possible inputs in my world or something. But the data sets where we're applying deep learning, like in those data sets, like we, we get by with a simple hypothesis anyway. The data sets where we apply deep learning, I think in general, we just about never see the same example twice, right? So like, yes, if you have this, if you, and another, another clarification I would make, by the way, is that there's nothing about the procedure that requires that you have 50-50 clean and randomly labeled. Um, you could train with 80% uh, clean and 20% randomly labeled, 90% clean, 10%, it doesn't matter. It's just that, um, you know, if you, if you have less randomly labeled data points, this is gonna impact your guarantee because it's going to, uh, remember that it's like, Error on the population is bounded by error on the source. Uh, so error on the clean plus one uh, training error on the clean plus one minus two times training error on the randomly labeled plus this one over root n term. Well, that one over root n term is gonna get big if you if you shrink the amount of randomly labeled data too much, right? So you need it because if you don't have a certain amount of randomly labeled training data, you can't even estimate what is your error on those examples. Um, so you need to have some amount, but it doesn't have to be 50%. Because I think if you're in a data set like classifying images or doing speech recognition or even like document recognition, you know, like any kind of document classification, unless you've made some like error in pre-processing, it's usually the case that you have no duplicates. So I, I think it's, you know, sure, if, if you truly had exactly duplicated examples, uh, you might have a problem. You know, if you, if, if you had exactly duplicated examples and then, you know, you're, you basically would say, well, you know, you, you can, you know, you basically would face this trade off. The only way you, you can get them to do right on the cleaning partition would be to uh, get them all to be, yeah. It's like, um, Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, like, think about how that pans out. It's like, interesting to think through, through at least, like, to, to give some intuition of how the, this, the, this thing works. So let's say that you have a clean and mislabeled data in some proportion, and you get all the cleans right. And which means that and if all the mislabeled were uh, chosen, happened to be among, you know, uh, duplicates, they had like 70% clean, 30% mis, uh, randomly mislabeled or something. If your mislabeled data points happen to all be duplicates for clean ones, and you nevertheless got all the cleans right, now you would show cleaning error zero and mislabeled. Um, that would be 100%. Mislabeled error mislabeled. would be one, which would be great yeah. because mislabeled error one means like, okay, you've done perfect. So this tells us exactly that we, we did perfectly, and this tells us that we did perfectly. Now, if somehow like the model, you know, the mislabeled training points, some of them win, and you get some of them right, this yeah. means that your mislabeled error is gonna come down and the corresponding, it just sort of fuses together that like your clean error going up 
correspond like your bound depends on two terms and like when if you actually had this like overlapped examples and these two terms would be kind of coupled to each other so like one of them getting worse means the other one is also getting worse right um but you know i, I think in general in the settings where this is best motivated that's probably not the thing that i'm most worried about okay yeah um thank you mm -hmm. Um, by the way, um, can I have a copy for the um, just for the slides? Because there was so many paper including in the slides. <laughs> Still have yeah, time yeah, of course. I'd be happy to send that over. Yeah, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Luke, and thank you everyone for joining. I guess we came to an end this uh, this talk, and I'm. Uh, and this uh, opportunity just to thank Zach once again for accepting the offer. <laughs> and yes, thanks for the engaging talk. Something to think about definitely <laughs> and have a look at your papers. Thanks, uh, it was thank great you. to see you all. Yeah, thanks again yeah, yeah. and thank you all for joining. See you next year. <laughs> Bye all. Bye. Bye.